Hello friends, <coughs> as you know we have been running this series called Feminist Theory Texts and uh, uh, this is the uh, penultimate month, next month we will wind it up and start another series later on and uh, today's lecture uh, as uh, Professor Payal Nagpal who teaches English in uh, Janke Devi Memorial College Delhi University uh, will we'll let you know and uh, will apprise you about the, the views that the, that the specific author she is dealing with will do. So, uh, in this lecture uh, which is on Luce Arigere and French feminism, it is an important aspect, slightly problematic also because there is always a kind of tussle between uh, French feminism and European or even uh, American feminism and uh, the voice is specific and uh, as you know that in Europe uh, France has some kind of an upper hand uh, as far as theory is concerned. So, um, a large number of uh, uh, critics, a large number of feminist thinkers, they emerge from, they come from uh, France and, and, and they have that kind of unique contribution to this particular thought. Uh, <coughs> uh, Louis Arigere uh, uh, would be uh, uh, always using uh, in, a, in her critical approach uh, the, the sociological as well as the psychological uh, uh, mixture and uh, she will then you know uh, offer a kind of dish uh, which will uh, provoke, which will uh, make you think and uh, which will also sometimes rattle the established thinkers. So, uh, without uh, any anything further, uh, I would request uh, Professor Payar Nagpal uh, to, to give us the lecture and uh, tell us about the person, about French feminism in general to the extent possible uh, within the framework and Louis Rigere of course. Welcome. Thank you Professor Prakash. Uh, today's lecture will be on uh, Luce Rigare and French feminism and uh, as mentioned uh, I will begin by discussing some of the seminal aspects of uh, French feminism itself. Uh, the question that needs to be asked is what is French feminism? So, some key factors that we need to keep in mind. I mean when we discuss uh, the feminism of the 1970s in France and uh, we give it a separate title and we call it French feminism. Uh, the three proponents, the three major writers here are of course uh, Helene Sixou, Luce Irigare and Julia Kristeva. Uh, but bef I mean how do we arrive at that moment of the 1970s? So, we need to understand that uh, broadly if you look at the 19th century, it was a period of great reform in France and uh, along with a series of other revolutions, we have a number of uh, you know women's groups that uh, come up in uh, the 19th century in France and uh, in terms of writing, a number of women's dailies also appear 1848 onwards. There is also uh, you know uh, uh, since there are a lot of women's groups that get together, uh, by the time we look at the 20th century, there is a proper uh, congress of women that is formed against fascism in 1934. So, uh, the women in France, uh, you know, uh, finally get the right to vote in 1944 and uh, it's interesting because uh, Simone de Beauvoir's second sex appears in 1949. So, uh, we have to look at the feminism of the 1917s against uh, this backdrop, uh, you know, that starts with the second wave. So, the women in France, uh, you know, 1960s onwards became very proactive and uh, became very conscious of their position in the society, uh, you know, both with respect to the existing social framework, uh, the resistance movements, reformist tendencies of the time and so on. For instance, uh, you know, they were very, very vocal about the French occupation of Algeria and also, uh, you know, even within resistance movements, they felt that women were, you know, really speaking not allowed to be in the forefront and were given uh, you know, uh, uh, really speaking, a very passive role in the movement. So, uh, and the references also, of course, uh, to the students' movement of uh, uh, 1968. So, if we look at, uh, you know, this anthology that actually appears called New French Feminisms, uh, that's edited by uh, Elaine Marx and Elizabeth uh, de uh, Cote d'Ivron, they suggest that the idea of new, the newness in uh, French feminism should actually be looked at what they call uh, synchronically, that is in terms of the intellectual activities in France at the time. At the same time, we also need to look at it in terms of the changing political equations that France is involved in, you know, whether it is with respect to Algeria or Indochina. So, in this regard, 
uh, you know, there is a group that appears which is called the MLF or in translation we would call it the Women's Liberation Movement. Uh, and Marx and Cotivron say the MLF, um, uh, and I'm quoting them, the MLF is not an organization. It is the name invented by the French press during the summer of 1970 to identify the diverse radical women's groups that had been visible in Paris, Lyons and other places since the fall of 1968. So, this first of all puts into perspective the need for a kind of newness 1970 onwards to understand the position of women in society both at the level of theory and at the level of practice. And uh, as uh, Professor Prakash pointed out, uh, you know, in the introductory uh, comments that, uh, you know, uh, Irigaray, for instance, combines the sociological with the psychological. And the reason for that is that uh, in France, uh, you know, with uh, uh, the Freudian, Lacanian uh, school, there was this uh, understanding of psychoanalytical theory. And uh, the women realized that this was really speaking not enough to understand uh, the, the, you know, constitution of women in society, whether it is at the level of uh, anatomy, interiority, uh, their social situation, the political situation. And so the 1970s then, in this sense, become very crucial. So uh, broadly, it was felt that there is a phallocratic interpretation that is used, that's dominated by the understanding, really speaking, of men. And women's groups and, you know, their contacts with women's associations abroad, really speaking, helped in this regard. Um, and I'd like to share a very interesting episode uh, that happens around this time. Uh, uh, you know, uh, this was the placing of the wreath on the tomb of the unknown soldier in Paris. And uh, it said, uh, to the unknown wife of the soldier and uh, feminists like Monique Wittig and Christiane Rochefort, uh, actually, where, you know, they were also present and they went to place this wreath uh, at the tomb of the unknown soldier in Paris. And the wreath was dedicated to the unknown wife of the soldier. And the French press was absolutely aghast at this because uh, the tomb uh, signified, uh, you know, French patriotism and nationalist sentiment and so on. And uh, to share a quotation, the wreath not only challenged these values and these rights, the wreath raised the possibility of another series of values, those unknown, that might have come, that might now come into being through the absent women. So this was actually a very important and, a, you know, in itself, really speaking, a moment of rupture that uh, we can say, uh, you know, in the context of, uh, uh, you know, the feminism of the 1970s. So. Uh, 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 I'd like to uh, ask Professor Prakash here and, you know, what he thinks about this movement that starts in the 1970s and uh, his views on this. I would uh, <coughs> first like to comment on briefly uh, this unknown soldier uh, who was a part of the French uh, military establishment and who took, you know, cudgels against what they called the enemy, whosoever the enemy was. Mm -hmm. uh, if you, uh, you know, see France and um, the other forces uh, confronting each other, then one doesn't know who is the enemy. Because mm -hmm. for both of them, the other is the enemy. And since the two are involved, and uh, uh, yes, uh, nationalism is, is the question that, that uh, males generally pursue. And uh, they forget about the, uh, you know, uh, ha uh, harm and uh, uh, violence that they cause to uh, people back home and the woman. So therefore, uh, you use the word aghast very, very, very well. The press was aghast because it's a male-dominated press. Yes. And that they would not like uh, uh, this kind of a tribute to be given to a woman. But then French women, as they are, would like to assert themselves. And in fact, I was uh, surprised that when in other countries of Europe, uh, the franchise was given to uh, all uh, uh, women and others in 1930, uh, in, the, in the case of France, it happened in 1944. 1944. So that, that also is surprising. Yes. And uh, I, I can understand the anger that women had. So uh, uh, all these uh, angry women, particularly uh, from, from French feminism, uh, they, they, they come from this background, as you rightly say, and uh, they belong as much to Simone de Bois uh, in, in the 1949 book uh, to the, their own 1968 uh, rebellion and uh, uh, the, the 70s and they are very close to us they are very close to the third world and 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 to international kind of womanhood uh, that, that that they project directly or indirectly 
That so, is absolutely uh, true. I agree with you. And uh, yes, it is surprising that the you know right to vote, really speaking, completely uh, comes uh, in 1944. And uh, from uh, 1949 to 1968, as you pointed out, there is this, it's, I think, this entire build-up that mm. is there for uh, feminists in the 1970s to react in a certain way. Because uh, largely speaking, there was this sense that when it comes to psychoanalytical theories, when it comes to, uh, you know, activist politics, there is uh, very little space for women. And so there was a need to actually also, uh, uh, you know, in the context of the uh, French, uh, you know, intellectual scenario, to take the existing theories, especially, you know, the uh, Freudian Lacanian school and to respond to them. And imagine, you know, that males generally talk about the body because body for them means uh, 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 some kind of a uh, factor, uh, uh, you know, influencing the world. But uh, uh, body in the sense women, uh, women understand it, that is not there at all. Mm. That, that is all feeling, ideas, rationality, whatever. But, but women will come forward with, with, with the actual idea of the body. Absolutely. In fact, uh, there is a complete denial on that front. And so there is a need for women uh, to express the body not only, uh, you know, in terms of uh, uh, kind of uh, marking it out, but also in terms of language. And that is something that's taken up in a very big way by these theorists. Mm -hmm. So um, the intellectual center then of the MLF was uh, the politic um, at uh, psychoanalyst, that is the uh, uh, psychic po as it was called. And they felt that a revolution can't come through a binary understanding of feminism. So some of the, you know, key uh, aspects of uh, uh, the, uh, you know, the changes that they wanted and some of the key aspects that they stressed in their theories was, in a sense, a disruption of what was called the symbolic order. The sense of, uh, you know, a coherent subject as defined by the society was to be done away with and, you know, uh, no coherent subject in that sense. A dislocation of syntax is another very important point. And when we say dislocation of syntax, the idea is not to just look at it in terms of, uh, you know, a syntactical approach, but to also bring in semiosis. And uh, so, uh, subverting not just the old order, but also the old language. And by old language here, what is meant is the way in which language was understood to be. And the French feminists felt that language was, in a sense, uh, seized, uh, really speaking, by the patriarchal order and it did not have any space in it for the expression of women. And uh, one of the routes that's then taken by the French feminists is to kind of, you know, uh, interrupt, intervene into the psychoanalytical uh, uh, construct and to uh, use, uh, you know, women's bodies to understand language. And that is an aspect that's taken up by the French feminists. What do you say about the control of the language, control of the sentence by the male factor of uh, argument, male factor of intellect and that uh, intellect alone is there to guide, uh, you know, a linguistic expression and nothing else is allowed there. So in fact, the kind of binary that you talk about is established already. Language will always be uh, ordered. It will always be controlled by a particular, uh, you know, syntax in, uh, and, and a pattern in the in the book, in, in, in the sentence, and the rest of the sentence is to be controlled by that. So, uh, in fact, intellect and uh, emotion, feeling cannot be separated. But but they always talk about, you know, the reason, argument, uh, you know, a kind of order, uh, which, which which is in fact doing damage to language and uh, doing damage through language to the entire uh, idea of consciousness, which is which is common to all. Uh, yes, that is true. And in fact, that's one of the things when they talk about disruption of symbolic order, the whole point of, you know, psychoanalytically, the acquisition of language, or for that matter, <clears throat> a dislocation of the syntax itself. So it's not as if they're not, they're saying that there has to be complete anarchy. But there is an understanding that the way in which women would write is something that is not really speaking, talked about, written about, spoken about. And so, language has to create that space. That space must be there for women to express, uh, as you said, passions, emotions, uh, not just, uh, you know, rational ideas, but to go beyond that, that state of fluidity. So, which is why Kristeva also kind of brings in the whole idea of the semiotic, uh, you know, in language. 
And uh, this is where, uh, you know, uh, if you look at both Thilin Siksu and uh, Luce Irigare, they also kind of totally resist, uh, you know, a kind of binary understanding of, uh, you know, uh, women's position in society and of language. So, Helene Siksu's idea of a creature uh, feminine, uh, you know, a writing that she says is from and towards women uh, must be understood in this context. And apart from Laugh of the Medusa, there is also, uh, you know, the newly born woman by Helene Siksu, which has uh, sorties. And uh, I'm, the reason I'm bringing in sorties is because uh, Siksu challenges uh, binaries in society because she feels they hierarchize everything. And this rejection of the binaries ties up with Irigare's uh, stress on the multiplicity in a woman's body itself. So, uh, uh, Siksu uh, explains how, uh, you know, when we look at active, passive and, uh, you know, sun, moon and so on. So, there is a privileging, in a sense, of the male over the female, where everything positive and rational is, you know, attributed uh, to the male, whereas... Uh, the female is always considered to be uh, more passive and so on. So, uh, everything in society within the patriarchal system reinforces, uh, you know, this kind of a binary opposition of uh, the man is active and the uh, male is active and the female is passive. And this Sikhsu sees as a combination of what she calls logocentrism and phallocentrism, the whole idea of locating meaning entirely from, uh, you know, the male point of view. And uh, this, uh, you know, essay and this uh, this idea of the combination of logocentrism and phallocentrism ties up, you know, it's a essay of 1975, it ties up with Irigare's, uh, uh, you know, uh, idea of uh, how multiplicity of the body is also something that is reflected in language. So, um, Irigare, uh, you know, was uh, born in So, 19 logo would be reason. Uh, logo would be reason. Isn't it? Logos is uh, meaning, Log logos is reason. Mm -hmm. So, so everything is, it's you know, in a sense, mm -hmm. uh, centered on meaning and this meaning or this mm -hmm. presence, actually, mm -hmm. logos is presence. So, this idea of the presence mm -hmm. is something that is signified uh, entirely by the masculine order as against the feminine, which is defined, uh, you know, in terms of psychoanalysis by lack. And it's separated from experience. It is totally separated. So, because the women are defined in terms of a lack and not uh, mm -hmm. logos, mm -hmm. so that experience is totally eliminated. Mm -hmm. True. So, uh, in fact, uh, uh, Irig uh, Maggie Hum uh, points out that says that Irigari addresses a key feminist question. What is the difference and therefore the politics of women's writing? Like Siksu and Julia Kristeva, Irigare links language and sexuality, but by contrast, Irigare praises the radical otherness of women's eroticism. So, she praises this multiplicity in the woman's body and where Siksu talks about the uh, a creature feminine and Kristeva brings in the idea of the semiotic, Irigare uses, uh, you know, the, the, women's, uh, the woman's anatomy itself to locate multiplicity of experience and to connect that to the idea of uh, both women's position and the idea of uh, language. So, uh, within, uh, you know, in a sense, uh, Irigare's uh, framework, the body figures as a very tangible trope and uh, Irigare interrogates women's uh, sexuality, their position in society, as well as their writing. So, these are all connected and in all this, uh, a woman's identity is seen as fluid and hence also more dynamic. And it is this multiplicity that creates space for women's expression. And uh, this is actually a very, very key aspect of Irigare's uh, writing. And in 1977, her essay, This Sex Which Is Not One, appeared. And uh, uh, that, in a sense, is a very important takeoff point to uh, foreground the woman's experience both at the level of the body and at the level of ideas. So, uh, uh, here again, I'd uh, request uh, Professor Prakash to, uh, uh, you know, share his views on how uh, Irigare in this sense is, uh, you know, also, I mean, she's part of the whole entire French feminist school, but uh, it's also a very direct response and uh, questioning of the psychoanalytical school. No, that is because they are laying ground for uh, the preference for 
uh, that uh, expression which is both rational and uh, at the same time emotional. And uh, when you uh, draw a line of distinction between the two, that emotional is not rational and vice versa, then you are in fact denying the, the possibility of women intervening in the uh, social world, in the ideological and, and, and literary world. So uh, it is essential that uh, reason is uh, uh, placed uh, at a place which is which it deserves, but then beyond that, uh, reason has to to, to uh, listen to uh, what is called the body, what, what is what, what is called the experience, and uh, body and experience, both of them are str strangely, uh, you know, uh, weirdly associated only with women, and women feel completely left out of place for that reason. So uh, let, let the, the, the two uh, uh, sections of society uh, understand from each other and uh, reason definitely should be regulated by, by, by the experience that, that is there all around it. So I, I believe that it's, a, it's, an, it's an approach which synthesizes then, you know, uh, puts things differently and uh, putting one, you know, higher and the other lower. So it's uh, the, uh, women's, uh, on this feminism and the women active in it are definitely not just democratic but also deeply humanistic. In and in fact, uh, French feminism then becomes in a, a very uh, uh, interesting prelude in a sense to, uh, you know, feminism of the 90s particularly when we really speak about feminisms, you know, looking at uh, the third wave and looking at uh, uh, how feminism cannot be understood, you know, how feminism, let's say, of the West is going to be different from feminism in a third world country and so on. So, having said that, uh, this kind of an interruption, this kind of an intervention, really speaking, by, uh, you know, the French feminists and irrigar in this context, uh, allows us to actually uh, bring in uh, intersectionalities, really speaking, of many kinds then. So, uh, this actually brings us, uh, really speaking, to a discussion of an important essay by Irigari, which is This Sex Which Is Not One. And if we look at some of the seminal aspects here, she uses anatomy to interpret the idea of masculinity and femininity and how these binaries were seen as a part of the Freudian normalization of women, so to say. Uh, Freudian normalization in the sense the whole idea in any case being of uh, you know the, the uh, a phallocentric approach where the man is always going to be defined in terms of presence and the woman in terms of absence and lack. So uh, where Freud in the f essay female sexuality presents the course of the normal woman in the sense that Freud defines uh, you know he presents three different roots and uh, finally defines how what normalization would really mean. So normalization would be, uh, you know, when the woman, the girl as she's growing up, finally directs her attention, uh, you know, to the male figure in the family. And uh, Irigare shows how Freudian psychoanalysis leaves no space for the development of female sexuality that is independent of this heteronormative mode. Uh, the, the, you know, female sexuality remains uh, determined, defined by and confined to the heteronormative mode. So, uh, Irigari is very uh, critical of this kind of a point of view and considers it to be very reductive, something that reduces uh, the woman to a lack and, uh, you know, meant for uh, use. So, uh, in can, you, can you simplify this word heteronormative? So a the bit for, for the benefit of the uh, uh, so young the I, student? Yes. So the uh, normative part of it is what is the normalization here? Mm -hmm. And the normalization is uh, a heterosexual relationship where the girl, uh, as she's growing up, when if her sexuality has to be defined, it has to be directed towards the male figure in the family, which is that of the father. From the She has to move away from the attachment towards the mother. And that, in a sense... Uh, you know, uh, in the Freudian context of female sexuality, defines uh, the woman's, uh, the girl's growing up, uh, really speaking, hence heteronormative. So she challenges uh, this kind of an approach and she uh, challenges this whole uh, Freudian school that uh, she considers to be very reductive. But at the same time, we have to raise this question of the way in which, uh, you know, French feminists are responding in a sense to the psychoanalytical school. So they are using the tropes that are uh, present there. Friends, in the uh, first lecture, uh, Professor Pair Nagpal has uh, uh, given us the background of uh, the 1970s feminism, which was uh, more or less dominated by, by, by the French uh, feminist writers. And uh, she has uh, made it clear now in, in general terms that uh, the, the tide is to be turned against the control of 
uh, the male, uh, you know, uh, uh, dominance, and that uh, women have to become uh, have, have to be uh, have, have to come forward in order to uh, give their perspective, a perspective which is more homogeneous, which is more harmonious, which is which is more uh, moderate than than the one which is uh, uh, on offer at present uh, in in the world of thought. And uh, this this will be taken up in in, in some detail with respect to uh, uh, Irigare in the following lecture. Thank you.